So questions for our panel. Hi, I had a question about uh, where the carbon's coming from. So Lisa showed that interesting plot, Lisa Marie earlier, where it looks like the, the carbon density in the, in the core and the wetland is not changing with depth. I mean, you would exp I would expect it to decline with depth and, and that decline to be associated with a, a lateral export. So um, in the absence of that, it's puzzling to me, where could the carbon be coming from? Now, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it's, it's all for all of you, but maybe Liz could answer it best with the, with the um, tracing uh, uh, the, um, uh, your, yes, the biomarker. That's what it was the word I was looking for, yeah. So, um, well, first of all, you know, there are many flavors of carbon, and just in our talks here, you know, it, throughout the morning we've heard about DIC, DOC, and, and POC, and I think, you know, one of the things we've learned from our study is that by measuring multiple pools concurrently, that the, the pools can be derived from different sources at, at any given time. So the, the biomarker work that I showed, that's just for the, the particulate organic carbon, and, and I do, you know, I think that the particulate organic carbon um, is supplying carbon to the marsh. In the, it's coming from the estuary into right. the marsh. And so, you know, I think, so a, a couple of things probably, I, I would guess that the marsh carbon is derived both from the, the plant biomass as well as this uh, other import that's coming from the the estuary, um, and and the bot. Right off the surface. Excuse me. Like coming right off the surface. Then, because that carbon's not declining with depth. Yeah. Well, I I wasn't able to tell from those profiles what the depth resolution was, and you know there can be a lot of respiration that's just happening in in that very surficial zone. So and anyway, I, I would argue that we need more information about the sources and the composition of that, the carbon, as well as these larger budget type approaches. Are you gonna do biomarker on the DOC at So it, it's, uh, we, we're trying to, um, actually we're trying to develop some different methods. The lipid biomarker work, um, it requires large volumes of water to do uh, biomarkers on, but we're actually uh, tr exploring the use of a, a different chemical method so that we hope we'll be able to have paired measurements of the dissolved and the particulate phase. Uh, hi, I was wondering if um, the so these measurements can address the fate of the DOC, whether it's degraded in the estuary or further offshore. And in, in the estuary, it could contribute to um, the oxygen budget, so oxygen drawdown, which in some coastal regions is problematic. So do any of the measurements that you're taking, uh, can you tell whether you have simple dilution or actual consumption in the near shore versus offshore? having measurements across transects from the marsh out to the estuary. And um, uh, um, first of all, it's not just um, uh, mixing, conservative mixing, but um, uh, it seems that um, uh, one of the main processes that um, uh, acts on this uh, dissolved organic matter export from the marshes is um, uh, light. So photochemistry is um, uh, the main uh, transformation process of um, uh, DOM, not necessarily decreasing the DOC, but transforming the dissolved organic matter, the color dissolved organic matter, and um, uh, making it more, uh, maybe even bioavailable in some cases. Now, some of this material, after uh, it's been exposed to light, it becomes bioavailable and uh, it's consumed by bacteria in the estuary, affecting microbial processes, yes. I can uh, follow up with that as well and, and say we, we, see, we see very similar things, and that gets into one of the, the troubles with uh, trying to understand qualitative t changes is that it's, it's been shown before that you can take terrestrial uh, DOM and bleach it and turn its isotopic 
signature and some of its optical properties into what looks like what we would call marine DOM. So it is a real challenge, and I think what we've tried to do is to, um, in, at least in, from our perspective, is uh, use multiple, uh, as many multiple proxies of DOM quality as we can, uh, from the, and then constrain as much as we can the, the conservative uh, mixing, and then look at the deviations outside of the mixing to try to interpret, as you say, how much reactivity has occurred. I uh, wanted to add that um, many of these uh, results are based on experiments we're doing in the lab to assess for the reactivity and uh, availability of DOM. But um, uh, in order to um, uh, better understand what's happening in the you know, natural environment, you can also integrate these observations with models, um, uh, about geochemical models that um, include some of these processes to really understand what is the interplay uh, between the processes. So, so. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, so I think to all of you. Uh, so this is a very uh, interesting point at uh, the photo uh, photo uh, chemistry. Uh, so I, I always have this uh, uh, question. You know, I I cannot so far I cannot um, hundred percent say that the AC generated. Uh, uh, you know, in the marsh areas, is it's just from the sediment. I mean, potentially it's supposed to be, but but I I, I worry that the, the DAC could come from all kinds of processes uh, in the in the tidal water uh, and, and just photo uh, you know photochemistry. Uh, but did you? I mean, I know Lee is a measure of DAC, but do you guys in the past have any? Um, measurement to you know measure DAC at, at the same time as you measure DOC or POC that you know the, the kind of um, see a, a lot of DAC maybe coming from some of the process in the, other than the marsh itself but but I think the carbon is probably still from the marsh I, I could speak to that a little bit we, we have um, a number a number of parallel observations of DIC along with DOC. And we also have isotope values of, the, of both pools. And so we've been trying to work with that to understand that question because we do see very isotopically depleted DIC values. And whether that is um, from respiration or photochemistry, we're, we're still trying to figure out where, where that might be coming from. Uh, so I think that's a good point. I, one of the other points I would probably make about that is that uh, in the terrestrial literature, there's evidence of, of, of DI or CO2 production from POC, from soils, direct, direct production. And so I would say in, in shallow environments like wetlands, that's something we probably could be looking at as well. I mean, even though we have very likely an overlying uh, amount of water that is very highly colored and so very absorptive and itself reactive, uh, the fact that you have a lot of exposed areas during the course of the day might also be an, an important uh, component that we just don't know the values for that as far as, as far as I do. If anybody knows what those values, please, please chime in. There, there's another really important term that you need to know for these fluxes, which is the water flux. So I was wondering if you guys could address the uncertainty in estimating the water flux and what technique might be the best. <laughs> Did yes. you? You can start. Okay. Uh, we have we've we have struggled with this, uh, uh, David, and um, I didn't present any any work that the related work that I've done uh, with with uh, uh, colleagues at NC State. But what we did in in a, in a very small uh, tidal creek, it was a restored tidal creek. Is we actually erected a um, a, a curtain <laughs> that uh, captured. All of uh, that captured the water and funneled it through the, um, the the flume system that we had set up. It was instrumented in order to capture uh, and close the water balance. So that's one approach. Um, I'm not a physical <laughs> uh, guy, so in that sense, so um, I could direct you to the person that would be able to tell you far more about that. But that's one approach we've taken. Now, in some of the systems that you've seen, we can't be erecting curtains everywhere. Uh, so another approach that we've, we've tried to use in, um, in Baldhead Creek is uh, using the LIDAR and estimating based on the, the schism model the extent of marsh platform 
that's inundated during the tidal cycles as a way to uh, better constrain the water, the water flux. But that has its own uncertainties as well. But those are two approaches that we've taken. Yeah. And I guess just to add a little, I, I totally agree. That, that's why I presented concentrations and net flux, not fluxes. And it's something that we're working on where we, we kind of have two different approaches, sort of a, a relatively crude approach of calculating tidal prism volumes. And then we're also trying to develop relationship. We, we have deployed ADCPs for periods of time and trying to uh, develop like a long-term relationship between water height measurements and those ADCP measurements. But it's something we're, that we're still working on. It, it's not where we want it to be yet. Yeah, this is definitely a uh, challenging um, uh, problem. And uh, in um, our case, we deployed a uh, Sontek um, uh, water fluorometer um, uh, to, to, uh, to measure the water flow in this system and then uh, multiplying these with uh, DOC concentrations to um, uh, get a DOC uh, fluxes in the system, measuring water flow uh, directly. But uh, now opening this to the um, uh, group here, what would be some recommendations? This is, um, uh, let's open the discussion to the group here. Are there any recommendations on how, what would be some recommended approaches on this specific question. Have people been doing things differently? Um. Thanks. Um, yeah, what we've been doing here, which Alec and Sophie just presented on, in terms of the um, water budgets um, component of that, um, is deploying a, an ADCP that's uh, uh, it's a Sontech IQ, which uh, I think you're using as well, Maria. Right. Um, and that's designed, you, you program into the device the geometry, the uh, plane of the uh, creek where you're doing your sampling. And so you get volumetric exchanges. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it seems to be a pretty good device. Um, but that only gets you maybe a quarter of the way there um, because um, not all of the water flows through the creek. When the water overtops the marsh platform, then you have sheet flow onto your basin. Um, uh, there's also topography to the basin so that more of the water uh, responds to the topography of your salt marsh basin on the um, exiting tide than on the entering tide. So you have this ebb bias. So um, if you were to take your um, ADCP water flux data and multiply it by your concentrations, uh, to get instantaneous fluxes, you would dramatically overestimate the, the export um, of material. Um, and I'm not a physical guy either, um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but we're working with, uh, with somebody in, in our office named uh, Neil Ganju, and, and he's applied an oceanographic model to the site, scaled down to a very small basin. And the basin is based on uh, LIDAR data um, of the topography of the marsh to get a, um, you know, a water drop analysis to get a, a basin that's contributing to the exit point on this creek. Um, and so that model then we used to correct the ADCP data uh, based on water heights. And I think this is an approach that a lot of people, a lot of people know physical modelers, you could get somebody to apply that model to your site and do those same corrections. And this is pretty well described, I think, in, in Alex's paper and Sophie's paper so far. Um, and so the reason, I think the reason you need to do that is because these fluxes um, are just not predictable from one tide to the next. It's just highly variable one tide to the next. And um, uh, the flux, the instantaneous flux is the product of concentration and, and net water exchange. And that changes rapidly with time as well. So some samples at low tide and some samples at high tide, high tide probably won't capture it. And then the last thing I'd say is that we may be able to, with this high frequency data, we may be able to do some, identify some simplifications um, that are predictive of what the high frequency data produce. I, I hope we can do that. So, uh, mainly question. Do you know, when, when we talk about uh, physical transports and, and concentrations, do we know if it's 
uh, dilutive or additive in the sense that if we have increased fluxes, do we get more stuff or less stuff, or doesn't is it not correlated? Because if you have a river and the river, in, if you increase the river flow, you would probably have the same amount of total stock of whatever you're transporting coming through, unless you have a some kind of, of corrosion or erosion upstreams. So, so because that would that would help in understanding how to do how to connect the physical transports with uh, with the biogeochemistry. Yeah, I guess. Um, I'll, I don't have the answer to that question, but there has been some work done during storm events, um, and, and basically those events uh, show that as as the storm as you get more flooding, that uh, that it has it doesn't really affect the DOC concentration, but it does affect the POC. So you know as storm intensity. Um, increases, you get greater erosion and, and loss of POC from, from the watershed. Okay, because in that case, my comment would be, that would be a good thing to find, figure out how much of an effect the, the, the flux has versus the concentration. Yeah, I, I agree. But um, yeah, another um, uh, interesting thing is that um, these um, uh, uh, changes in water flow affect also the origin of this GOM in the wetland, uh, the um, uh, area of the wetland that is inundated. Mm -hmm. So it's going to affect also uh, the quality of DOM that is exported from the marsh, which is another complication in these tidal exchanges and how they relate to changes in water flow. We, we've seen that as well. And in fact, uh, in, in, in Baldad Creek, what was interesting is that it, this, this is flooded not just, it's not open to the ocean, it's flooded by the Cape Fear River itself that has an extensive amount of wetlands, it's black waters um, flowing into it, that sort of thing. So we're already dealing with a very high uh, influx of organic matter. And we find um, in instances where we do still have a net export of DOC that looks more from the qualitative uh, end of things, like the marsh signal. So we're seeing more of an influence of Spartina as opposed to the very largely terrestrial signal that we see from the Cape Fear River proper. So I'm a physical guy. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, in, in, the absence of, if in the absence of a current profiler, if you have a, um, there's a couple of like, of like sort of uh, Kluges you could use. One would just be some pressure sensors, and with a with a appropriately distributed set of pressure sensors, you could come up with phase diagrams of, of making some estimates of the way that the tide is propagating in and out of your system. Uh, if it's small enough and there's not a river, then you can you could use continuity to estimate basically the rate of change of water level to come up with with fluxes. Those could be constrained with short-term ADCP measurements. Um, and then the other thing you could do is you could partner with your local uh, estuarine physicist, and they, they might be interested. Um, <laughs> you could go to the Physics of Estuaries and, and Coastal Seas meeting and talk with them. So they'll have answers. Uh, Chris, I had uh, I was interested in your surface vehicle, and I had a couple of questions. I think you mentioned that you had to switch out pay, um, sensor packages. What, what limits the payload that you can put on that vehicle? It looked pretty capable. Uh, it's just the, the weight of the instrument package and the power supply, the power supply. So, so what we, so we optimized it for, um, for is we, tried to, we tried to fit as many different sensors on it as we could, and the best way we could, when, when we, you know, in concept, we thought, oh, this will work great, even with the uh, uh, sea robotics, but then during the design and construction, we ran into some issues with powering it, and, and there's been actually a, a lot of back and forth in, in shaking down uh, the way the systems work. And so power seems to be a, a real problem uh, in terms of being able to have all the types of instruments we want in providing them power, not having them be so heavy that they overload the uh, propulsion system, and then having enough power on board in order to um, program the USV and let it map for a period of time or navigate it. Um, and just as a quick antidote, I can say that 
if you do get into this, I recommend during in its deployment, depending on the system you're working in, definitely have a chase boat that can shoo away paddle boarders and other people that are interested in um, using it as an obstacle course. So some of the challenges that we developed. But yeah, it was, it was a little bit trickier than we thought it was going to be originally in terms of getting all the instrumentation we wanted and being able to operate it. You, you anticipated my second question about right. operations and <laughs> <laughs> avoiding things. As sort of a follow-up to that, um, I was curious if it's capable of doing vertical profiles and if any of you have looked into vertical variability even in the relatively shallow systems uh, and how the, I know we're talking a lot about the physics, but how the vertical variability of the biogeochemistry affects these estimates. We, we, are, uh, we do not have the ability uh, yet on that platform to, to do vertical profiling, um, but is, and, and we, have not, <laughs> we have not done it, but I, I agree that's definitely an important dimension that we need to consider. Yeah, most of our, uh, our work is in very shallow systems, but, um, uh, and some um, uh, initial measurements we did to look at vertical um, uh, patterns dynamics, uh, we didn't see any strong vertical um, that variability, but uh, this can change, it's variable as well, so more information is needed um, uh, on vertical uh, patterns, definitely, for different parameters as well, um, and linking to photochemistry, which is mostly um, uh, happening on the surface. I'll just follow up and say, I, I don't really know the details, but there's a group here at Hui who have developed a, a motorized kayak, they call it a jet yak, and on that system they have um, put a small A-frame and been able to deploy a winch, a small CPD in shallow waters. So there is precedent for doing that kind of thing from an autonomous platform. It can be either remote controlled or can be pre-programmed with waypoints with GPS. Yeah, not to make too much of a pitch for the company that built our system, but uh, they do have a lot of, of options available for that, and so the, um, the vertical profiling capability is one that they do uh, promote. Hi, Maria. It's just about the result that's behind you. I mean, how, how do you perceive using satellite data in a in a in a useful way, because to use to estimate fluxes, you mean? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it seems like you've got to get the tidal mm -hmm. cycle stuff right. Yes. So um, uh, this is um, uh, the next step for us. I think would be um, to combine with uh, models, hydrodynamic models, to um, uh, get more information on um, uh, water flow and uh, using this as you know DSC stocks concentrations and converting these to fluxes. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, satellite observations, we would need higher uh, frequency observations. Um, uh, so having observations from a geostationary platform would help. Having more observations from uh, um, uh, aircrafts um, uh, would help as well. Getting the temporal um, information, the temporal scale. Hey, uh, this is for Maria as well. Um, I was just wondering how, if you thought maybe your algorithm could be sensitive to bottom reflectance and detritus in these really shallow areas, and if maybe that could have had a role in the tidal dependence. Yes, um, now we looked specifically at that because um, now NAP affects uh, the short wavelengths as well. And um, uh, we didn't see any strong correlation between the DOC predicted by the satellites and the NAP, uh, the non-algal particles sediments uh, in the water. And um, uh, the reason for that is because um, uh, in our approach, we use um, uh, the full um, uh, uh, spectral information that you get from satellites, and we use the remote sensing reflectance information. We don't estimate the total absorption and then divide this to absorption by NAP and absorption by DOC. And if you look at the RRS, the remote and reflectance um, uh, spectral signal, the NAP is going to have actually the opposite effect than DOM because NAP mostly backscatters and it's going to affect the longer wavelengths um, uh, more. So this is why we're able to differentiate between NAP and CDOM um, 
in this using this approach. Okay, thanks. Hey, Chris, I have a question about blue carbon DOC export. Um, Lisa Marie talked about the importance of using language carefully to, to describe the age of the carbon that's buried in the marsh, like accrete versus sequester versus bur burial. And I was wondering if you have any um, indication of what age or liability of this DOC that's, that's the blue carbon DOC, is it older material or is it just DOC produced in the wetland that's considered blue carbon? Yeah, I think that's a good question, and um, we do not have any ages of the DOC samples that we've taken. Um, so we're, we're looking more at qualitative indicators and um, using biomarkers such as lignin as well as stable isotopes. And I can tell you that part of the, you, you do raise a good point because part of the challenge is looking at, um, is needing a gradient of differences to partition amongst these pools. And one thing that we observed in Barataria Bay, uh, where there's a far more active erosion and mangrove encroachment, is that tends to scuttle the ability to use uh, your isotopes the way you'd like to, because it's just not an entire marsh C4 dominated Spartina system. You've got a variety of other sources. And so what we found is that we've, um, you know, we've, we've benefited more from using the, the lignin biomarkers in that case. Um, but it's, it's a good point in terms of trying to figure out where those sources are versus fresh plant exudate uh, as opposed to what might be leached out of um, poor water, flushed out of poor rathers rather. Um, and also I think we should consider uh, phase transfer, particle to dissolved uh, desorption. As particles are resuspended into the water column and mixed around and exported out, uh, there's, there's good evidence from a number of studies that there's, there's uh, uh, phase transfer in both directions between particle and dissolved. So I think that's, that's uncertainties that we have, but it, it goes to the point of being a bit more specific and, and trying to constrain that as well as we can. Yeah. Thanks, that's interesting. Okay. I think we're at lunch time. Uh, we're close to it. Oh, we do? No. Okay. Uh, let's see, before the stampede occurs, are there any other questions or comments for the... Uh, anything I think presented, we can, you know, we can field the microphones around to uh, our earlier, our plenary speakers or the first, uh, the first part of this session. I'm not really a physical guy, but I'll try. So um, on, on the top chart, just looking at the tides, you know, in the summer you have that regular tide, which is meteorological, and then you noticed in the wintertime they had the high and low tide, and, and that's probably wind force tide. You know, the nor'easter blows the, the water out, and that happens in many of the coastal embayments. So there's some really old papers in Chesapeake Bay where uh, they related export from marshes to winter storms, where they talked also there was ice. So it's not only the, the, the water blowing out, but they hypothesized the, the ice would kind of cut up the marsh and release the carbon. But it's, um, the, the more nor'easters, maybe the more that flux happens. I'm, I'm wondering whether um, any of you have <clears throat> studied extreme storms such as hurricanes or near hurricanes, tropical uh, depressions of kinds, and seeing the difference between the export because my recent experience in Puerto Rico was that a single hurricane brought down 11 tons of river uh, erosion material out into the shelf and that's very extreme and of course uh, cleaned out um, all of the kinds of outflow from the riverine into the estuarine and onto the shelf. Yes, and this was um, exactly one of the objectives of developing some of these um, uh, uh, remote sensing algorithms actually because you have the opportunity to um, uh, uh, compare different um, uh, months different um, uh, seasons, years that are affected by high precipitation events. So we were able to see that in the Chesapeake Bay with 2011 data sets. 
um, uh, and um, uh, we saw the impact of um, uh, um, uh, the storm on DOC, on uh, sediments in the estuary as well, but also DOC with very high concentrations of DOC um, uh, in the whole estuary from the freshwater input from Susquehanna as well, but um, uh, wetland export as well with um, uh, highly absorbing um, uh, dissolved organic matter exported to the estuary. Um, our goal is to uh, sample storm events, and, and we've been storm chasing but haven't been successful in catching many of those events. But, I, but we did catch one, and I can say that while um, on average Taskinus Creek was acting as a sink, the, the marsh there was acting as a sink for estuarine POC, during that storm event, we saw a reversal of that, where actually the, the marsh became a, a source to the estuary. So I think I agree that events are a really important um, component of our, of the budgets that we're collecting. Um, I also think the, uh, the FDOM sensors that are being used more frequently, that those will give us a lot of insights about storm events when we're not actually able to capture, you know, water samples or, or whatever. I see that as being a, a useful tool for better understanding those events. So um, I'm more an open ocean guy, and I'm really interested to learn more about the estuary and, and, and uh, uh, sorts of circulations. But it sounds like extrapolating from your talks to the rest of the field um, that most of the sampling has been sort of Eulerian, you sit in one place and make long-term measurements or uh, make measurements at least in one spot. And the problem with that in terms of trying to define fluxes is getting the horizontal gradients defined. And I'm just curious whether people have tried doing Lagrangian measurements where you track water parcels and sample beside them and see what kinds of transformations take place as you go and how you can marry the two approaches. I, I can speak a little bit about that. I mean, there's a... It was kind of a classic study of how the lower Mississippi, uh, there was a Lagrangian uh, study of that, how the, how the lower Mississippi operated. And I think those would be very useful. Um, and, and, a, and a colleague, um, uh, Scott Ensign, uh, at, who has a company that he builds this uh, hydrosphere. And the interesting thing about that, if I, if I had the hydrosphere right now, it looks like a giant beach ball. And again, it, you might think, well, I mean, that's pretty small. How are you going to observe much with that? But the aim of this device is to be able to do Lagrangian type studies in smaller systems. And I think that th those approaches are, are what, uh, you know, are, are what we need to be thinking about, how we can get uh, Lagrangian approaches to see how the biogeochemistry of water parcels change as they're moving, you know, as they're being forced by tides and circulation and all that. I'd recommend looking into swarms of vehicles as well, uh, rather than just following one. You get better statistics. Okay. Well, I, without, without any other uh, questions, I think that's the end of this session. And so we will move on to lunch. Thank you.